Hi again, and welcome to the third in my series of short talks based around my book, Second Class Citizens. In this session, I'm going to talk about the origins and purpose of the UK welfare state. As you probably know well, the modern UK welfare state began after World War II. The war had physically damaged housing and infrastructure in the UK, so there was a physical need to rebuild. But the war had also brought the lives of the urban poor into the rural areas, revealing to many for the first time just how unequal, poor and even inhumane the UK society could be. It was made apparent that charity from the rich had utterly failed to end poverty. At the same time, people from all economic classes had contributed to the war effort, whether sending men to fight on the front or working in the factories and on the land at home to supply the war effort. So there was also a sense of solidarity. It was a time when it was possible to truthfully say that everyone was in it together. And where everyone had suffered together and strived together, the natural wish was to go on to succeed together, to end the poverty that so many had endured for so long, and to rebuild a country that acted for the good of all of its citizens. Politicians also had half an eye on the communist countries, whose ideological commitment to the poor made unregulated capitalism look bad. So capitalism needed to be harnessed to work for everyone, and that was the goal of the welfare state. As William Beveridge said, Now, when the war is abolishing landmarks of every kind, is the opportunity for using experience in a clear field. A revolutionary moment in the world's history is a time for revolutions, not for patching. World War II showed that governments could organise on a massive scale to achieve specific goals, and if they could do it for war, surely they could also do it for welfare. So William Beveridge was commissioned, whilst World War II was still being fought, to investigate the causes of and potential solutions for poverty in the UK. His report, titled Social Insurance and Allied Services, is the most popular report ever produced by a UK government selling over half a million copies. He argued for a cradle-to-grave system of support for UK citizens based on rights rather than on hated means testing and hangovers from the poor law which effectively treated poor people as criminals and had resulted in such stigma that many people would do almost anything other than ask for financial help from their government. Beveridge said that the UK at the time was facing five giant evils – want, ignorance, idleness, disease and squalor. Want means poverty, caused by lack of work or low paid work. Ignorance was not just about the poor lacking a general education, but also about the ignorance of the rich regarding the depth, extent and causes of poverty in the UK. In a cartoon from the period, ignorance is depicted not as an illiterate schoolboy, but as a fat, well-dressed giant looking down his nose at the sword-wielding beverage. Idleness was not a comment on people's work ethics, but a condemnation of the government's failure to guarantee enough work for everyone. Disease refers to illness and injury, and in particular to treatable conditions where the poor were prevented from recovery and returning to work because they could not afford to pay for medicine and treatment. Squalor was the conditions in which many poor people lived, referring to unsafe, unsanitary and overcrowded accommodation. Each of these five giants was to be met by a national state level solution. Social security, national education, full employment, national health service and a national house building programme. In return for this support, citizens were asked to pay national insurance when they were in work and to agree to look for work when they were unemployed. It was a reasonable requirement at a time when jobs were largely for life and the government was committed to ensuring enough jobs for every person who wanted one. So the Beveridge Report made concrete suggestions on how to remedy these five evils. In doing so, the government and citizens of the UK would together rebuild the country on a fairer, more moral and ultimately more productive footing. Beveridge considered that it was entirely possible to build and fund such an economy, and that it was right to do so both pragmatically on economic grounds and morally on the grounds of human rights. The implementation of the welfare state coincided with, and most likely contributed to, 
years of strong economic growth and a rapid drop in debt as a percentage of GDP. To target want, Beveridge proposed both that the government strive for full employment and that it provide social security to those who are unemployed. Those who were healthy were to look for work in return for social security, whilst those who were sick or injured would receive financial support without conditions whilst they recovered. Social security was meant to be subsistence plus, that is, enough money to live on, plus a little extra for unexpected costs and the variations, vicissitudes and vagaries of life. This, Beveridge felt, would not be so much money as to stifle incentive or the desire to look for paid work, but also would not be so little as to leave anyone in destitution. It was unfortunate that Beveridge underestimated the costs of subsistence, that his benefits were introduced late and without consideration of the impact of inflation since Beveridge made his proposals, and that uprating of benefits ever since has not kept up with inflation. The result is that whilst governments have cut social security again and again, benefits never were enough to live off, let alone be a disincentive to work, and every cut in the name of incentivising work has instead pushed people further away and deeper into poverty. The insurance principle was key at the time. In theory, the national insurance contributions of those in work would cover benefits for unemployment, sickness and old age. In practice, the government does not separate out national insurance contributions from other taxes in order to target the national insurance towards state benefits. This is probably fortunate, because with $124 billion spent in 2018-19 on pensioners by the state pension and other benefits, there is very little left for children and working age adults from the $136 billion national insurance contributions. In practice, National insurance is just another income tax. It is also only one of a variety of ways in which people contribute to society. Other forms include the actual work a person carries out where that is indeed a useful contribution, childcare, caring duties and families and relationships, and participation in social, religious and community activity. The point is that we all contribute to the state in one form or another even if we never manage to earn enough to pay an income tax. The idea behind national or social insurance contributions is that, having contributed as we can, the state then pays out when we need it. But an approach that is based on collecting contributions from people's earnings is exclusionary of all the other ways that people contribute to society, and in particular it ex excludes the people who need it the most, the poor. In a modern welfare state, the counting of national insurance is an anachronism that has little practical purpose. Periodically, in the press or political commentaries, someone will moot the idea that we need a social insurance scheme for health costs or for unemployment costs. Or it will be suggested that employers who don't currently do so should take out insurance so that they can improve their sick pay offer above the statutory minimum. For example, in 2016, the government seriously suggested that employers should purchase income protection and health insurance for their employees as a strategy for enabling sick and disabled people to return to work. What these suggestions rather ironically forget is that employers already do purchase income protection and health insurance for their employees. It's called national insurance. Employers not unnaturally may query why they should have to purchase insurance twice when they thought they had already paid their premium to the state. There are additional problems with private insurance schemes. For example, such schemes not unnaturally prefer to take the healthy and job secure and ignore or charge prohibitively high premiums to those in the so-called toxic jobs the low-pay, insecure, high-strain jobs at the bottom of the labour market which cause and exacerbate illness. It's not unnatural that private insurance schemes should act like this. They have no social obligation to the poor. And whilst insurance schemes do act to smooth out the cost of negative events across the population as a whole, private schemes aim to do so at a profit. But this is not the case for the government. The government does have a social obligation to its poor citizens, and it has no reason to seek profit. A profit for the government 
it's just a wasted opportunity to improve in and invest in the country. Compare the US private health insurance, which doesn't cover everyone equitably, with the UK's NHS. The US spends nearly 18% of GDP on healthcare at over $11,000 or £8,750 per person. The UK spends around half of the US expenditure at 10% of GDP and just over £3,200 per person, and with far better healthcare access for the poor. Many people who have access to private healthcare will know that whilst it offers speedier access than the NHS, it often doesn't offer anything else, with the same doctors working in the NHS as in the private sector, and the private sector passing any complicated cases or emergencies back to the NHS after they have cleaned off the profitable, simple cases. The private insurance sector is not an adequate or appropriate substitute for government-based, nationwide social schemes for income protection and healthcare. Such national insurance type schemes are necessary if a country wishes to ensure that people suffering misfortune are not also condemned to suffering poverty. Only the state can provide this sort of protection. Neither individuals nor private companies can afford to do this and it would be highly inefficient for them to do so. Nor is the charitable sector an adequate alternative to the government. The public support for a particular issue is not a good barometer for that issue's importance. For example, most people would agree that the well-being of disabled people is of more importance than that of badgers. But a petition against culling badgers as a way to control TB received over 300,000 signatures in six months. A petition on flawed disability benefit assessments took two attempts, a year and a lot of hard work to get 100,000 signatures. Robert Louis Stevenson wrote that, In real life, help is received from the hand of friendship or it is resented. His point is that merely donating to charity is a patronising, aloof and uncaring way to relieve poverty. This creates a problem for the rich man who wishes to give through charity, for, in Stevenson's words, he has the money and lacks the love which should make his money acceptable. That is, by giving money but not time and friendship, the charity of the rich is experienced as degrading, stigmatising and undignified. But, says Stevenson, there is one course which the unfortunate gentleman may take. He may subscribe to pay the taxes. There, were the true charity, impartial and impersonal, cumbering none with obligation, helping all, there were a destination for loveless gifts. And Francis Beckett, a biographer of Clement Attlee, wrote that charity is a cold, grey, loveless thing. If a rich man wants to help the poor, he should pay his taxes gladly, not dole out money at a whim. So the UK government introduced the welfare state to overcome the inefficiencies of private insurance and charity. The welfare state was more efficient in the money it spent, covered more people and in a more equitable manner, and sought to ensure that no group was overlooked, forgotten or rejected by the needs of private capital and the whims of the privately wealthy. However, Beveridge had forgotten one group of people, the disabled. Prior to the NHS, penicillin and modern medicine, many people who live today with chronic illness would then have died. Most of those who were disabled would have been cared for at home by mothers or sisters who would have been working at home anyway, or they lived in institutions. But the only financial support available was the generic unemployment benefit, which didn't easily recognise long-term sickness or disability. So whilst the new welfare state brought in a great deal of success, leading to a period of economic growth and stability now referred to as the Golden Age, it wasn't perfect. There were still gaps and oversights. Next time, we will look at the start of campaigning by the disabled community to fill in the gaps in the initial welfare states. <laughs>